So when you look at us, us as humans, as apes, as primates, as mammals, when you look at some of the most appalling realms of our behavior, much of it has to do with the fact that social organisms are really, really hardwired to make a basic dichotomy about the social world, which is those organisms who count as us's and those who count as them's. And this is virtually universal among humans, and this is virtually universal among all sorts of social primates that have aspects of social structures built around separate social groupings. Uses and thems, we turn the world into uses and thems, and we don't like the thems very much and are often really awful to them. And the uses, we exaggerate how wonderful and how generous and how affiliative and how just like siblings they are to us, we divide the world into us and them. And one of the greatest ways of seeing just biologically how real this fault line is, is there's this hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is officially the coolest, grooviest hormone on earth because what everybody knows is it enhances mother-infant bonding and it enhances pair bonding in couples and it makes you more trusting and empathic and emotionally expressive and better at reason, reading expressions, more charitable. And it's obvious that if you just like spritzed oxytocin up everyone's noses on this planet, it would be the garden eating the next day. Oxytocin promotes pro-social behavior until people look closely. And it turns out oxytocin does all those wondrous things only for people who you think of as an us, as an in-group member. It improves in-group favoritism, in-group parochialism. What does it do to individuals who you consider a them? It makes you crappier to them, more preemptively aggressive, less cooperative in an economic game. What oxytocin does is enhance this us-them divide. So that, along with other findings, classic lines of us versus them along lines of race, of sex, of age, of socioeconomic class, your brain processes these us-them differences on the scale of milliseconds, a twentieth of a second, your brain is already responding differently to an us versus them. <clears throat> okay, so collectively, this is depressing as hell. Oh my God, we are hardwired to inevitably be awful to thems and thems along all sorts of disturbing disturbing lines of, oh, if only we could overcome these us-them dichotomies, the world would, oh no, are we hardwired to divide the world along lines of race and ethnicity and nationality and all those disturbing things. And what becomes clear is when you look closely is it is virtually inevitable that we divide the world into us's and them's and don't like them's very much and don't treat them well, but we are incredibly easily manipulated as to who counts as an us and who counts as a them. And those fault lines that we view as, oh my God, how ancient can you get that say somebody of another race evokes limbic responses in us commensurate with they are a them, they respond, they motivate automatic responses. Oh my God, is that just a basic fault line? And then you do something like have faces of same race versus other race and either they are or aren't wearing a baseball cap with your favorite team's logo on it and you completely redefine who's in us. Us is people who like the Yankees and them are Red Sox fans. And suddenly you're processing within milliseconds what damn baseball cap they have in races being <clears throat> completely ignored. Oh my God, we are inevitably hardwired to make really distressing us them. We're manipulated within seconds as to who counts as an us as a them. Good news with that, we can manipulate us out of some of our worst us-them dichotomies and recategorize people. Bad news, we could be manipulated by all sorts of ideologues out there as to deciding that people who seem just like us really aren't and they're really so different that they count as a them. Okay, so fabulous study showing this, this double-edged quality to oxytocin, and this was a study done by a group in the Netherlands. And what they did was they took Dutch university student volunteers and they gave them classic philosophy problem, the runaway trolley problem. Is it okay to sacrifice one person to save five? Runaway trolley, can you push this big beefy guy onto the track who gets squashed by the trolley, but that slows it down so that five people tied to the track. Down. 
standard problem in philosophy, utilitarianism, ends justifies means, all of that. So you give people the scenario and people have varying opinions and now you give them the scenario where the person you push onto the track has a name. And either it's a standard name from Netherlands, Dirk, I think, who's like a Pieter or something, which like if you're, this is like a, a, like a meat and potatoes Netherlandish name, or a name from either of two groups that evoke lots of xenophobic hostility among people from the Netherlands, someone with a typically German name, oh yeah, World War II, that's right, that was a problem, or someone with a typically Muslim name. So now they're choosing whether to save five by pushing Dirk onto the track or Otto or Mahmoud and in general give them those names and there's no difference in how people would rate it than if they were anonymous. Give people oxytocin where they don't know that they've gotten it. Control group has just placebo spritz up their nose. Give people oxytocin and kumbaya you are far less likely to push Dirk onto the track and Dirk is and you are now far more likely to push good old Otto or good old Mahmoud under the rails there and you are more likely to sacrifice an outgroup member to save five and you are less likely to sacrifice an in-group member. All you've done there is exaggerate the us-them divide with that.